I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but uh, a lot of this Bible is prophetic. And we talk about being prophetic. We're not talking just about telling the future. We're talking about a call on our lives that means business. When you read and study the prophets, and I'm not preaching from the prophets today, but you read and study the prophets, these are people that gave their lives. These are people who were spit upon and cast out and lost their lives, many of them losing their lives for what they had done. Actually calling people to repentance, calling people to live a life that is fully for God. After all, Jesus is the great prophet, the greatest prophet of all, and they crucified him. And we don't like preachers who are prophetic because they challenge us. But let me tell you something. We need to be challenged. We need to be challenged to the core as a people. Now, some of us here today certainly are, 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 this is not really for some of you. This is for a big chunk of you, but not for some of you. But the reality is, is that when we have a prayer and devotional time on Wednesday nights and no one shows up but maybe four or five people, it tells me as your pastor how little you think of prayer and devotion. When we have a men's group that meets on Friday morning, and it's a very difficult time because it's at 6 a.m., and I understand not very many people can make that, but when we for, for weeks, months, and even years go for, with only two or three men showing up at 6 a.m. to pray, and I don't always make it because I have things sometimes get in my way, that tells me something about the spiritual vitality of the church. Because if the men don't pray, and they're not willing to commit some sacrifice to pray together, it tells me that the church is going nowhere. And that's the prophetic word this morning. That's a hard word. It's not a word I'd like to give. But it's a word that I, hopefully it's not just my flesh, it's not just my human passion that's giving this. But the reality is, I really hope it's the Spirit of God. The reality is, is that we as a church are not very committed. We're committed to the things that we think are okay, fit in our schedule, but we're not committed to the things of God as a community, as a church. You may be committed individually, but it doesn't mean that we're committed corporately. And I don't think that our church has been very committed corporately since I've been here, and that's on me. That's on me. But that's just, that's my take on things. So that's how we begin this sermon. That's a nice word, isn't it? It's a prophetic word. And you know I love you, but I'm sharing my heart, and I'm being bold, because Jesus was bold. Paul was bold. The prophets in the scripture were bold. And so I'm only trying to be faithful to that call in my life. Would you pray with me for this message that God would speak? Lord Jesus, as we enter into this word, help us to understand. Help us to understand your call in our lives, how you want good for us. The prophetic call that I've been referring to is not a call of a call to something that is bad for us. It's a call of great encouragement because as we turn our lives over to you, the Spirit of God comes upon us and encourages us and gives us the boldness and the commitment and the passion to be true to Jesus. And that's what we need. So, Lord, as we turn our lives over to you, as our lives become about something other than ourselves, pour out your Spirit and help us to make a difference in this world. May this word be not my word, but your word. Amen. Two weeks ago, I preached from Genesis 3.16, and in that message, I began with a statement about great competitors in sport. Uh, it was pretty ridiculous talking about great competitors in sport, uh, pointing out bocce ball competitors and this kind of thing, and Mr. T and all that. You know, I tried to be a little bit humorous there. Uh, and it was kind of a ridiculous opening, but then I got another ridiculous opening for you. Uh, it's, a, it's an opening that has to do with play. Now, play is not ridiculous in itself, but my reference here may sound kind of funny or at least kind of crazy. Uh, I, I wanted to begin by talking about decibel drag racers. Are you familiar with decibel drag racers? I'm sure some of you are. It's a really big deal in certain circles. 
uh, there's, a, there's a subculture of decibel drag racers. Uh, NPR, and I don't listen to much NPR, but N NPR has a, has a program called This American Life. And it, a number of years ago, it ran a special report on decibel drag racers. Uh, and, and these are people whose very, uh, pr their prized possessions, the things that they value the most are their car stereos. Do you know anyone like that? I mean, how many times have you pulled up to a stoplight and the, you know, it's like the person to your right or to your left has got that window rolled down and it's just, you know, it's like just, wow, great. I didn't know that everyone on the street wanted to hear that. Uh, there are people out there like that. Well, anyway, NPR ran this program uh, on decibel drag racers. And we're not talking about people that are interested in driving. We're just talking about people who are interested in playing, playing very loud. Here's how the sh a segment of the show goes. It goes like this. I've been to a couple of these now, and I'm always left with the same question. Why? Oh, why? Oh, why? Oh, why? It's not prize money. There's hardly any in it. And it's not women. There aren't any of these uh, things there either. There aren't spectators, unless you count on other uh, competitors and the few glum relatives who appear to be taken here against their will. Uh, my best guess is that it's all about the quintess quintessential American obsession with glory, however fleeting. Everyone wants to be the king of a hill. That's international, but the number of aspiring kings always dwarfs the number of available hills. Isn't that true? So true. So in this country, we build more hills. And that's what des decibel drag racing is about. It's another hill to get your glory. Uh, maybe someone here wants to be a part of it. Uh, the reason why I started with decibel drag racing is because it points out the fact that some people are so serious about their playtime. I mean, they're, they're, they're willing to give a tremendous amount of effort into their playtime to do crazy things. And play is not a bad thing. Play can be a very good thing. We know about the benefits of play, particularly for children. Uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics, in an article in 2007, wrote this about, about play. I'm not going to give all of it to you, just, just some of it. I want to read this to you, and I put it up on the screen. Play allows children to use their creativity while developing their imagination, dexterity, and physical, cognitive, and emotional strength. Play is important to healthy brain development. That's the most important statement. Play is important to healthy brain development. It is through play that children at a very early age engage and interact in the world around them. Play allows children to create and explore a world they can master, conquering their fears while practicing their adult roles, sometimes in conjunction with other children or adult caregivers. As they master their world, play helps children develop new competencies that lead to enhanced confidence and the resiliency they will need to face future challenges. Undirected play allows children to learn, hard, uh, learn, how, learn how to work in groups, to share, to negotiate, to resolve conflicts, and to learn self-advocacy skills. And the list goes on and on and on. Play is very important to children. It's important in their brain development. Let me suggest to you that play is also important for adults. Uh, we need to have a good time. Uh, we need times other than hearing the pastor, you know, be prophetic, right? We need times where we just can relax and enjoy the moment, the time that God has given us. Um, I mean, we've got to be clear about this. We actually were made to have fun. We were made to have a good time. We really were. That's the way God made us. And church is supposed to be fun. It's supposed to be a good time. That's why there's so much music reference in the Psalms, right? Music is supposed to be joyful. Like when I began the service this morning, it was supposed to be a playful yet significant time singing about the fact that they hung Jesus Christ on the cross. There's great joy, and there's, a, and there's, yes, I'll just say it, there's even a type of play in the fact that we can think about and rejoice in, the, in what God has done for us, particularly on the cross. There can be a type of, like, release. That, wow, Jesus has done that for me? You mean, you mean I can be forgiven? Wow. And it just sets our hearts free, and we, be, can, we can actually enjoy life. 
we can have the joy and discovery that we need, like in a children's playtime. And so we began the service with Psalm 92. Psalm 92 uh, goes like this. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High. Now, the Hebrew word is definitely praises here, but, there's a, but the Jerusalem Bible, interestingly enough, actually uses the word play. It's really talking about the playing of instruments, but it uses the word play. To sing praises to your name, O Most High. To declare the steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night. To the music of the lute and the harp and the melody of the lyre. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work. At the works of your hands I sing for joy. So there's this incredible affirmation of getting into this play, playfulness and in just enjoying God. Church is supposed to be fun. Church is supposed to be full of joy. That's what church is supposed to be about. Um, having, I'm going to make this announcement. I've already made it. Having play time is a part of human life. As the proverb goes, all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. Right? You're familiar with that. You've heard that. How many times have we heard or been around people who don't play? And, wow, they don't end up having any friends, do they? They just don't. Uh, but this being said, this being said, a life dedicated to play, and see, that's the other side of it. A life dedicated to play is a life dedicated to something less than what God intends for human life. I think you know a few people whose lives are dedicated to play, Right? Uh, I know a few people whose lives are dedicated to play. That's, what life all, that's all that life really is. How many fun times can I get in, you see? How many trips can I go on, you see? People who have financial resources. How much fun can I have, you see? Uh, and yet, you know, this is a dangerous thing because, I mean, if you, if, if you, uh, if you remember Ecclesiastes, which is my favorite book in the Bible to begin uh, unbelievers in. You know, hey, uh, uh, Paul, I really don't know the Bible, and I want to understand the Bible, and, I, and it's just one of these lifetime goals for me to understand the Bible, and I, and I don't know where to begin. Would you direct me someplace? A lot of times people say, well, you know, one of the Gospels and so forth. And that's good. Sometimes I do that too. But I really like telling people, go to the Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes is where you need to start. That's the book. Look at Ecclesiastes 2, verse 1. I said in my heart, come now, I will test you with pleasure. Enjoy yourself. But behold, this also was vanity. See, this also was futile, this kind of thing, futile. This also was like, well, there's an emptiness about it. Pleasure, there's an emptiness in it. Verse 2, I said of laughter, it is mad and a pleasure. Why use it? I searched with my heart how to cheer my body with wine. My heart still guiding me with wisdom and how to lay hold of folly till I might see what was good for the children of man to do under heaven during the few days of their life. It's vanity. It results in nothingness, emptiness. And that's an important word for those who have dedicated their lives to playtime or who think that's really what they got to do. Oh, I can't wait for the weekend. Because the weekend is, the, is, is my free time, and I understand that. I totally get that. But I'm going to use the weekend to just do what I want to do, you see. Because my life is dedicated to play time. It's a tragedy. It's not what God intends. Play, 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 you see. We know about those who have dedicated their lives to playtime, particularly those who have uh, lots of resources, lots of financial resources, and our culture is filled, I mean filled, with the broken lives of those who have had lots of money, who use their money for nothing but play. Our culture knows all about the problem of affluenza, right? Right? Okay. But if play is not enough to fill the human spirit, because that's what we're talking about, Maybe work can fill the human spirit. Maybe that's the direction I can go. I, and you know the man, and you know the woman. Maybe you're one of them. I don't know. But you say, well, you know what? You know, I just don't enjoy playing. I don't really have any hobbies. So I'm just going to work, work, work. That's what I really, I really want to do. 
And by the way, the pressure's on. The pressure's on our young people to be successful. And so work, 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 and work some more. Get into the college of your choice. Get those big scholarships. Get into that great school, whatever it would be. Be successful. You see, the pressure is on. I mean, after all, if I am not successful, oh no, who am I going to be now? You see? Um, our self-esteem, our identity is so wrapped up in these kind of things, some of us, you see. Uh, and look at our role models, right? Our role models in our culture are all about success, success, success. And usually they've gotten there by work, 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 right? I mean, I don't even have to mention our political candidates, do I? Work, work, work. That's how they got there. It's, that's what their lives are about. Whether we're talking about business, politics, whatever. And I'm going to mention their names, okay, because you know what I'm talking about. Um, I hope that you see the complete vanity in work, work, work. You know, Willie Loman in this great play, uh, The Death of a Salesman. I don't know if you've read it or gone, gone to one of the performances or so forth. It's, it's a play from many decades ago, but it's a great play by Arthur Miller. Willie Loman has this, one of these great lines, I love it in this play, and it goes like this, it goes, you work a, work a lifetime to pay off a house. You, f- you, you finally own it, and there's nobody to live in it. Right? People who dedicate their lives and try to get this, say, this huge mortgage, I'm going to just work really hard and get this paid off. I might even go on the, on the, on the two-week payment plan as opposed to the once-a-month plan. You go on like a, a every two-week plan. I'm going to work extra hard, get a, make a little bit more money, find a way to do it, maybe work an extra job, do something. I'm going to get this done early, but guess what? When you're done paying off the mortgage... There's nobody to live in it. Kids are grown up and so forth. Work, work, work. And if you know anything about me, you know that if there's one thing that I err on, that's actually the side that I tend to err on. I love, well, there's a part of me that it can be very ambitious, too ambitious. And I I have to watch that. Okay. So last week, or two weeks ago when I preached, because last week we had Jerry Kester here, our superintendent, who gave a message. But two weeks ago, I preached the message, and I preached on Genesis 3.16. And that text goes like this. To the woman, he said, this is after the fall, after they ate the fruit in the garden, so they're getting the consequences of the fall. To the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall, shall rule over you. The woman here in this, and I'm not going to go over this uh, again, but uh, except to say this, the woman here is reminded that something's wrong. Something is wrong, you know, uh, in, in life. Something is just out of kilter. Uh, obviously, e- Eve, the first woman, knows this because of these very words, but, but women in our society are supposed to know that something is wrong. There's pain and childbearing. And then this, this really remarkable thing, that, uh, here in verse 16, your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. In other words, the relationship between you and your husband who you really want to be close to just doesn't quite work. That's actually a sign to you that no matter, no matter how much you play, 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 you no know, how much you work, 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 things are not going to actually work out that well. There's going to be an emptiness in that. And, and the key word in this passage in verse 16 of chapter 3 in, in Genesis is the word pain, Hebrew isaban. It's a, it's a word that just, just kind of should go right to our hearts and kind of just kind of go, oh, oh no, this is, how, how are we going to change this? And, 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 to the, and to the man, God says this, and this is where I'm preaching on today, this is my main focus anyway, and to Adam he said, verse 17, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain, same word, same word, hesabon in Hebrew. In pain, you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you are taken for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Like I said, the key word is pain. Uh, the, the problem came to Adam because he listened to his wife, and 
I know there's a sermon or two right there, right? I mean, we, men, men find some humor in that. But, the, but, but there's, there's, uh, it's, it's more about who are we listening to, and there's a, there's a couple of sermons there. Who are we listening to in our lives? Um, we see in this passage that the world is really kind of written the wrong way now. You can think of any model you want, whether it's writing like a story or whether, whether we're talking about maybe from biology, DNA, but there's something wrong with the world. The world now is going to give resistance in the same way that verse 16 tells us that the woman's and the husband's relationship are going to be like this. They're gonna be, there's going to be resistance. There's going to be contrariness in the, in the relationship. Now we see contrariness in humanity's relationship with creation in general we see that there are really a couple of images that are used here in terms of this contrariness. One, of course, is the use of agriculture. Verse 19, uh, oh, verse, I'm sorry, verse 17 and 18. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. You're going to have a tough time here. Adam, you listening to me? You're going to have a tough time in your life trying to make things work. I put something on Facebook on this the other day, and I had someone uh, uh, wrote down that, hey, I think life's pretty good. Well, lucky Americans, right? I mean, we're not out there farming all the time. Uh, most of us are off the farm, and so we don't deal with this as directly. But life can be pretty tough, pretty tough for us, lucky Americans, I suppose. But the principle is the same. The creation is now working on some measure against us. So the first image is one of agriculture, but there's actually another image that's used here that's more than agricultural. Verse 19, By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and dust you shall return. Now we've entered into not only the world of agriculture, now we're talking about decay. That we live in a world that decays. Our bodies now decay. Death is introduced physically into our lives here. I'm going to live only so many years and I'm going to return to the ground. From dust I was taken and dust I shall return. So what does this all mean for our work in this world? It can only be, no matter how hard we try, on the human plane, it can only be for the sake of survival. That's it. It doesn't get any better than that. We've seen many advertisements on TV, you know, the, the, the guy, I guess, I don't know, what, is he drinking the beer with friends? It doesn't get any better than this. Well, with, you know, without Jesus, they're right. That's it. That's not true with Jesus. It's better than that. But the reality is, is that we live in a world dominated by death. And the older that we get, the more we see how true this is. Young people kind of forget this. They just don't, they don't get into it. They don't buy into it. They think they can live forever. But as we age, we begin to see, yes, our lives are dominated by death. So the question is, if it's not play, 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 and not work, 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 what do we do? Is there any way out of this entire mess that came to us because of the fall? Well, do you remember what we said a couple of weeks ago about Genesis 2.15? Uh, put that up on the screen for you, Genesis 2.15. The Lord God took the man. This is before the fall. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And do you remember what we said about that, about that context of that work, what God was doing? God was giving Adam meaningful, purposeful work. Uh, this, is, this, is a, this, is one, this is a favorite passage for gardeners, Right? For those of you who brought vegetables into the church today, God bless you, right? For those of you who brought them in the weeks before, God bless you, you see. For those of you who like the garden, God bless you. This, this is good word for gardeners, right? But the point is, is, is really that God wanted nothing but good for the man and, of course, for the woman who will come shortly. God is for our own good. Th this was the kind of work that... Well, it even had an eternal character about it because the man, you see, and the woman didn't have death. Death was not introduced until after the fall, which also tells us, there's a little bit of a freebie here, tells us that the human beings were designed to live forever. 
Human beings were not designed to die. They were designed to live forever. Um, and, and do you know what made Adam's work really satisfying? Yes, there was loneliness and so forth, and God re- uh, deals with that by bringing in the woman. But do you know what made his work really satisfying? It was satisfying in part because it was God-directed. There's, there's, a, there's a sense of like, whoa, God tells me to do something and I do it. There's something really good that happens there. But it was also satisfying because it was also part and parcel of God's plan for the world. It's not just that God directed Adam to take care of the garden. That's part of it. But it's also because this was God's plan for the world and Adam got to be a part of God's plan for the world. Because remember, God made Adam and Eve, made the two people, it tells us in Genesis 1, made them in his image, and God has always wanted to get his image across the whole planet. You see? That's been God's plan for all time, to get his image upon the planet. And they were to be fruitful and multiply, and God was giving them dominion, wide dominion, so that they would take care and his name would be lifted up throughout the whole planet. You know what? That tells us a great deal. See, the question today is very simple. The question today, and this is really the fundamental human question. This is it. This is the fundamental human question. How do we reclaim, not just claim, but how do we reclaim a purpose-filled life while living in a fallen, resistant, decaying world? How do we do that? You know, people don't ask that question directly as they get up in the morning, you know, and they brush their teeth and, and you know, grab something quick to eat and head on to their jobs. They're not saying, wow, today how can I get that purpose-filled life? You know, I mean, how can I reclaim that? They don't generally ask that. But in their hearts, especially when they're going to bed at night and they just have time to look at the ceiling and just kind of think about it, about their lives and what, the, what their lives are about, in their hearts so often they're asking this question. What is my life about? What am I doing? The world tells me I'm doing pretty well. I'm raising a family. got some children. Some of us don't have that. Some of us look at ourselves and we go, boy, you know, my dreams didn't even come true on that level. I don't even have those things. What's my life about? God is a redeemer, by the way. At the risk of getting off in this message, I want to tell you something. I don't care where you are, what you're doing in your life. I don't care how bad your circumstances have been or how much your dreams did not come true. God is a redeemer, you see. That's what he's in the business of doing, you see. But the human question is, how do we reclaim the purpose-filled life while living in this fallen, resistant, decaying world? And you know what? Here's the answer. Here's the answer, and I wish the world would listen to this. It takes faith, but here's the answer. We reclaim our purpose-filled life when we discover and participate with God's purposes in the world. You see, that was right back there in Genesis 1, right? God made the man and woman in his image and gave them dominion. Why? So that his image would, would carry throughout the world and for eternity. That's really the idea. And you know what? You know what? It's an option for us. This is the great news of the gospel. That we actually get this. We actually get to have what God originally intended for humanity. This is why Jesus came in the world, so that we can actually get this stuff. You see, it's not about play, play, play. That's going to lead to destruction and emptiness and nothingness. And it's not about work, 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 because that's going to lead to Emptiness and destruction and nothingness. It's about working God's plan and purposes in this world. Oh, you want to be on God's team? God's team is about getting things like fulfilled, like getting us right. God's team, you see. When I give a prophetic word and challenge this church to come on Wednesday night for prayer and devotion, what I'm doing is I'm saying, get on God's team. Get on it. This is not the pastor's team. This is God's team, you see. Now, we have an enemy, and the enemy will do whatever he can to distract us from this. 
The enemy will lie to us. Oh, you got to be about play, play, play. Oh, no, oh, you got bill problems? You got to be about work, work, work. And, and he will use temptations to get us off the path. But if we stay focused, you see, we indeed can be in God's plan. Now, remember what Jesus says in John 6. This is very important, very helpful. In John chapter 6, Jesus says this, knowing that human beings have a difficult time getting on God's path and following Christ. He says this, he says, do not work for the food that perishes. Welcome to our world. Welcome to the billions of people who work for the food that perishes. They work, work, work. Some of them are lucky and they get to play, play, play. And at the end of their life, their lives are meaningless anyway and they go to the grave. Jesus says, do not work for that. Don't work for that. Don't you dare work for that. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man, that's his way of referring to himself, which I, he says, which I will give to you. For on him, on Jesus, on myself, he's saying, the Father has set his seal. In other words, you can be assured of this. You can be assured that this is true. Then they said to him, what must we do to be doing the work of God? Great question. I'm glad you asked. Jesus answered them, verse 29, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. Think about that. Now put that in garden context. Put it back in Genesis, right? What was the problem with the man and the woman? They didn't trust God. They didn't believe God. They really didn't believe God. That's what got them out of the garden, right? The work of God is that you do this. Believe in Jesus Christ. That's a word that's not just about the intellect. It's about the heart. It's about the whole self. Trust me in ways that you've never trusted me before. And you will enter into my plan for this world. You see. Now, some of you are going to say, well, but pastor, you don't understand. You know, I go to my job and it's awful. You know, some of you are going to say, I don't have a job. Others are going to say, well, you know, the job I do have is terrible. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's tough. I don't see any purpose in it. I just can't get, you know, I can't go there. I totally understand I remember I sold cars for a couple of years, and it's like, wow, Lord, this, is just what I, this isn't what I want to do. This doesn't seem to be the right thing for me to do. And it was difficult. But anyway, some of us say, look, 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 my job is meaningless. But I would just direct, just direct you to Paul, direct you to Paul with, with lots of grace. Where Paul says in Ephesians 6, bond servants, in other words, slaves, you see, slaves, because there was a slave culture there. Bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart, as you would Christ. Not by the way of eye service, such as people pleasers. In other words, don't look to try to please humanity. But as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this is, that this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bond servant or is free. Then he tells us about masters. So the point is, is that, that in, the, in even the worst of conditions, with the help of God, it takes the Holy Spirit to do this, with the help of God, we can actually receive joy in our work. And if that's not enough, just consider what Paul says in Colossians 3. He says in verse 16 of, of uh, chapter 3, it begins this way. He says, let the word of Christ dwell in you rich, richly. That's critical, right? If you're not listening to the word of God, if you're not bringing it in, you won't have any faith. He says, well, he says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, see, now we're getting into your work. Whatever you do, in word or deed, everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Now we're talking about even the most meaningless tasks. You see, whether we're talking about cleaning toilets, or whether we're talking about sweeping floors, or whether we're talking about running for president, the most meaningless tasks, you see, can be used in a way where Jesus Christ is lifted up. And by the way, isn't that the point of the cross? Being lifted up, right? 
Jesus said in John 12, 32, he says that I will lift all men to me. You see, he says, when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to me. And do you know what? God wants to use you in your time at work. He wants to use you and in your time of play to draw people to him. And there's something about being on God's team and being used, because people are watching, being used to lift Jesus up. Go to Jesus, friends. Go to him. He's the one who can make your play have meaning, make your work have meaning. He can fulfill your lives. We all desperately need that. Let's pray. Father, this morning, I know that I gave a difficult word, at least to begin with. Um, But Lord, I just pray that you would be in this whole message. And I pray, Lord, that, that the word that was spoken would make a difference in someone's life, whether it's in this place, or whether it's somewhere out there somewhere, because we do put these messages online. I just ask, Lord, that you would be lifted up and that you would bring your people into this purpose-filled life. So we pray this, Lord, with repentant hearts and with hopeful hearts. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen.